Hello and welcome once again to another retro review for Cheap Shot Entertainment. And uh, we're still going through the year 2002. We're now in December. It's December the 15th, 2022. 20 years ago on this date, we had Armageddon in WWE terms, of course. Armageddon 2002. It took place at the Office Depot Centre, or now known as the National Car Rental Centre, um, in Sunrise, Florida. And it, like I say, it was a, a joint effort between Raw and SmackDown, joint pay-per-view. And uh, it took place on the 15th of December. Um, in front of 9,000 pe- 9, 9, people, and of course it's on the network on demand uh, or peacock if you're in america uh the theme song very rare um the end by jim johnson uh, the classic composer that gave us many many great entrance themes including stone cold's entrance theme the undertaker's entrance theme the rock's entrance theme um and all sorts of other entrance themes the man was just genius um and obviously the main event is Shawn Michaels versus Triple H. The last two members of the Elimination Chamber where Shawn Michaels won the championship. This is for the world title. Uh, and that is going to be contested in a two out of three falls. What they would call a three stages of hell match at this point in time. The arena, of course, is appearing in a couple of video games. It is WWE 2K15. WWE Smackdown, Here Comes the Pain, and WWE Raw 2. And uh, without further ado, let's get into the main part of the video. Uh, but before we do that, if you like the video, and you like liking what we're doing with the retro reviews, 20 years uh, have passed since we do the reviews, and we release them on the exact date. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that I'm doing in between, obviously work and stuff like that. So I hope you're appreciating it. And if you do, please click like and subscribe, uh, leave us a comment. Can you remember this pay-per-view? Of course, I can't remember whether it was still available on channel four at this point in time. I believe that was more the 2000s that were available on channel four in the UK. Um, well, let's get into this one. Uh, it's the last show of 2002 before we move into 2003. Join me there. This is awesome. This is awesome. So we get the opening promo package uh, featuring Classy Freddy Blassie. Uh, God rest him. And... Uh, yeah, get the music as well. The end is near, the end is here. And we go straight into the fatal four-way elimination tag team match between for the sorry, for the World Tag Team Championships, the um new, newly minted World Tag Team Championships, because they were the old style tag team championships when the brand split came. Smackdown got the championships over there with the blue. Looked like the classic tag team championships. Love that championship. And uh, Raw got their own championship with the gold and red and all that kind of stuff. I've got both of them actually. Um, in child tag, in child uh, title belt form. Um, for you know, I think I bought them when I was at uni. Uh, for a for a night out, so yeah, another story for another time. But <clears throat> it is Chris Jericho and Christian, the current champions, uh, going into this, and uh, they are going against Booker T and Goldust. William Regal and Lance Storm, who are on one hell of a run, apparently uh, at this point in time, winning seven tag team matches in a row, and uh, the Dudley Boys. As well, Devon and Bubba Ray Dudley, the newly reformed Dudley Boys, uh, as of Survivor Series 2002. 
<clears throat> anyway, um, yeah, so basically there's two people in the ring on this one. Unlike the championship match for the tag titles, the triple threat, where three people were in the ring at any one time, so it's more like a traditional triple threat. There's only two people in the ring in this one. Um, so tags can happen anywhere, they can happen to any team. Uh, obviously you're going to get a lot of tags between teammates. Uh, it obviously doesn't take long for this one to break down, um, but <clears throat> basically what happens for the first fall is that uh, William Regal gets the blind tag and uh, uh, after a 3D William Regal comes in. He does eventually get the uh, um, because because the sorry because the 3D was on Lance Storm referee doesn't count because William Regal is legal. Uh, William Regal then goes for the pin and uh, Bubba Ray tries to roll through. William Regal rolls back and a bit of a hook of the tights or the shorts in this case and William Regal eliminates the Dudley boys. There was a bit of confusion here between the fans and the commentary desk as well because it didn't quite look like it had, but it had. So uh, yeah, the Dudley boys are eliminated. Quickly after this, um, Goldust comes in and eliminates William Regal and Lance Storm with uh, the, uh, in fact, <laughs> I can't even remember how it, how it happens. But they eliminate uh, William Regal really quickly in this one. So Landstorm and William Regal are eliminated. And then we get down to the last two. So I mean, they, that didn't take too long to actually happen. So um, yeah, there's that. It's, it, it happened really quickly. That being said, that section of the match was pretty good. They kept it nice and clean for the most part and then just the sort of melee towards the end of that first opening section of the match uh, to get the two quick pinfalls so we've got the current champions Jericho and Christian in the ring with Booker T and Goldust um, so who is going to pick up the victory here uh, lots of hijinks here from Christian and Jericho with a title belt shot that hits uh, squarely between the eyes to Booker T. Uh, Booker T kicks out, manages to kick out. Christian goes for the uh, title shot again, walks straight into a bookend as Goldust and Christian are fighting on the outside and uh, gets the victory for his team. So we have new World Tag Team Champions in Booker T and Goldust. And it's their first run. I think it's Goldust's official first tag team championship in the WWE. And I believe it could be Book T's as well in the WWE. Not his first tag team championship, but in WWE is his first tag team championship. So, uh, yeah, really, really well done match, actually. Um, apart from that first section being really quick and the second section being uh, probably twice probably twice as long as the first bit eliminating two teams uh, but we then got to see like the pure tag team uh, bout which I'm always in favour of and to say these two teams been chucked together they were really well you know worked really well together worked well as, t as a team and uh, yeah just really really it was it was a good match just in general it was a good match so I'm going to give this one three and a half cheap shots out of five. Uh, it wasn't perfect. Probably too many teams in this one for how it panned out. But I understand they've got to try and build up a new tag team division. So it was perfectly good and a really good opener. They do seem to be really good openers in 2002 WWE. So uh, we move on to the next match and I'll see you there. We go to the back now with Josh Matthews, who is trying to find Brock Lesnar. He does happen upon Brock Lesnar and asks the burning question on everybody's lips, which is, 
are you going to be in Kurt Angle's corner tonight? As Kurt Angle has promised, Kurt has promised Brock Lesnar his the first title opportunity should he win the championship. Brock Lesnar says he is here to make an impact. And as Taz alludes to, Brock Lesnar always makes an impact. We go on to the next match now. It is A-Train versus Edge. Edge is defending the honour of his good friend Rey Mysterio at Survivor Series. They lost the Tag Team Championships to Los Guerreros. And uh, during uh, an episode of Smackdown, A-Train wanted to make a name for himself. So he attacked Rey Mysterio with a chair and subsequently attacked Edge with a chair, hitting both of them on the knees. Uh, Edge managing to uh, probably not make a full recovery from the attack, but enough to appear at Armageddon to uh, have a match with A-Train. Uh, this match uh, is two contrasting styles. Of course, Edge being uh, quicker and probably a bit more of a high flyer. He does uh, come off the top rope quite a lot during this period of his career. Um, even though he's going for main championships, main event championships. Uh, in fact, there is one spot here which is absolutely awesome. And if... Um, you want to see uh, a big guy fly, then this is, well, it's one of the matches. Obviously, the main match for that is Rikishi jumping off the top of the cage on top of uh, Val Venus back in 2000. Check it out. I uh, can't even remember which show it was from, but it was cool anyway. Um, so one of the main points in this match, Edge tries to fly off the top. Obviously not a match for Albert in terms of strength, so he tries to use his quickness and his high-flying ability. Albert, or A-Train, uh, hits him with a thrust kick off the top, uh, which is quite good, uh, quite impressive, because A-Train gets his, his foot up really high in order to cut Edge off. Um, but it would end in a bit of a downer, because... The finish came in the, at the hands of a steel chair, which Albert brought into the ring. And uh, in front of the referee, Albert gets disqualified by hitting Edge on the knee again to try and take him out. Um, bit of a sad finish to this one. Never like disqualification finishes unless there's a reason for it. I didn't see a reason for this, uh, apart from the fact that it was the steel chair that took Rey Mysterio out. Um so uh, Albert then tries to continue the assault. Edge manages to kick the chair back in Albert's bowling ball sized head. And uh, yeah, uh, he then assaults Albert with the chair. Uh, the referee tries to stop Edge from doing so. Edge scares the referee out of the ring and uh, continues the assault until the chair is no longer basically. Uh, Ed is your winner by disqualification in this one. And uh, I'm going to give this one... It's a bit of a throwaway match, really. I'm going to give it one and a half cheap shots out of five. Did what it needed to do to further storylines, but uh, not my preferred way of finishing a match. Um, I mean, at least when you've got a manager with you, you can distract and do all that kind of stuff. Like Jamie Noble and Nidia, uh, who do it absolutely perfectly. Uh, as a duo so yeah like i say one and a half cheap shots out of five bit of a throwaway bit of an in-between match uh you know you have your big starter uh then you have your in-betweens and this one was definitely an in-between match uh we go to the back again with the big show and paul Heyman. paul Heyman is uh Really worried um, because Brock says he's here to make an impact. Big Show just looks at Paul Heyman and says, get it sorted. Um, and uh, yeah, obviously Paul Heyman does his uh, worried face uh, because Big Show is a big guy. Uh, hence why he's called Big Show. And uh, we move on to the next match. So the next match, um, yeah, 
it's just up and down and up in this one. It's it's like riding the it's like riding Space Mountain. Except without Ric Flair. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, this match, really good. Um obviously we've had the world championship match. Uh, world tam tam world tag team championship match. So there is no WWE tag team championship match on this show because Eddie Guerrero, one half of the Guerreros, one half of the WWE tag team champions in 2002 in December, is in a singles match with Chris Benoit. Um, obviously, Chris Benoit, Kurt Angle have gone their separate ways now. They're no longer a tag team. Kurt Angle is in the championship match, having won the fatal four-way. Eddie Guerrero cost Benoit his chance at becoming number one contender uh, in that fatal four-way match after being eliminated uh, by hitting Benoit over the back of the head with his title, uh, thusly getting him eliminated and uh, leading to this little feud. So they're, they're former friends, uh, now going towards being enemies. They've got a lot of kinks to work out, obviously. And what better way to do that in WWE than do it in between the three ropes in the squared circle. So, yeah, this match is bloody good. It's excellent. It's a wrestling masterclass. Obviously, these two absolutely know each other inside out uh eddie guerrero being all dastardly and heel uh, and really just trying to take every shortcut he can uh chris benoit leaning towards the sort of more face side uh, of his of his character still really intense rabid wolverine um and um yeah it's just a real back and forth this uh and um you know for all of Eddie Guerrero's early work on Chris Benoit. Um, Chris Benoit manages to come back really, really well uh, and uh, pick, pick up the victory with the crossface despite being hooked up in the lasso from El Paso. And I have said before on videos how much I love that move because it's great. Um, even with interference from Chavo Guerrero, with the title belt initially um, on the outside and a couple of times when Benoit goes up top for the uh, flying headbutt, uh, Chavo gets involved again. Uh, it doesn't factor into the finish. However, uh, like I say, Benoit gets locked into the lasso from El Paso. He manages to Reverse that into a cross face. Eddie Guerrero almost reaches the ropes. As Taz says, the ring can be your worst enemy or it can be your best friend. And as someone who is training, that couldn't be any closer to the truth. Um, it's, yeah, it can be all sorts of crazy in, in there. Um depending on how it's feeling that particular day, whether the ropes are tight or, all, or you know, all sorts of different factors. So, uh, yeah, this match, bloody fantastic. Submission finish uh, and, and having the downer of the disqualification finish in the last match between Edge and A-Train, this really picked up the show. This, this could be the highlight of the night, um, apart from, the obviously, the main event. And it's, it's nothing more than you'd expect from Eddie Guerrero and Chris, Chris Benoit. He, uh, both of them are brilliant, um, obviously no longer with us. Uh, one celebrated, one not celebrated. Uh, it doesn't take away from his in-ring work, in my opinion. But yeah, I know why the WWE don't talk about him. He's still on all the shows. They, they've not tried to blur him out. He still has his part in history. But yeah, um, maybe that's that's a discussion for another another day. But um, yeah, great match from both of them. Either way, I would have been happy whoever won. Um, great finish as well. Like I say, Eddie Guerrero almost reaching the rope. Benoit 
uh, sorry, he, he nearly reached the ropes, tried to roll through uh, to try and get the pin with the shoulders down, but Benoit uses the momentum and rolls all the way through and uh, gets the victory. Eddie Guerrero taps out to the crossface. At this match, I'm going to give four cheap shots out of five. Really good match. Uh, fantastic match. I'm dropping it down a cheap shot because of the cheap shots that Chavo was uh, privy to. Um, maybe the one shot, you know, that's that's absolutely fine. Uh, with Eddie Guerrero feigning his, his injuries and stuff like that. Um, so they did it really, really well when they did do those interferences. Uh, to the T, in fact, but um, just one too many in the match. Uh, kind of took away from the the ending. Um, yeah, really good. We move on to the next segment, which is Paul E, or Paul Heyman, as he is known in WWE, uh, wandering in on Stephen McMahon, saying, you know. Why is Brock Lesnar being allowed to enter the the building? Should be suspended. Stephen McMahon says his suspension is been lifted, and it's up to Brock Lesnar whether he wants to appear to appear at ringside or not. Uh, Paul Heyman then comes back with uh, a warning for Brock Lesnar and for Stephanie. He said if if Brock Lesnar gets involved, then Big Show will break Brock Lesnar's neck. Um, and Stephanie smiles. I've got to say, Stephanie is looking very good uh, in uh, in her business suit and holding a coffee. Uh, yeah, always had a bit of a thing for Stephanie, man. Uh, definitely the business suit for me, definitely. Anyway, what's your favourite version of Stephanie, man? Mine's definitely business suit, man, from 2002. So the next segment we get is both alluring and a testament to how far wrestling has come. Um, it is a segment involving Dawn Marie and Tori Wilson, uh, two of my favourite divas, I have to say, uh, for more reasons than the way they look. Uh, but this... Obviously involves Al Wilson. It is that storyline with Al Wilson marrying Dawn Marie. Dawn Marie says that she will she will call off the wedding to her dad. It not Dawn Marie's dad uh, to Tory Wilson's dad, Al Wilson. If Tory Wilson meets her at room three five seven, which is her hotel room, which is Dawn Marie's hotel room. And does anything that she asks her to do. Um, because she admits that Al is not the only Wilson that she has an interest in. Wow. We're going for the incest angle. I completely forgot about this. That being said, uh, she rolls the footage. Because, you know, wherever you go, you've got to be cameras, of course. And... Uh, yeah, this is, um, I'm going to say it, this is hot. <laughs> this is genuinely, um, like, really right on the edge of uh, 2002 um, WWE. Um, there wasn't much to upstage this until, obviously, 2005, when you had the live sex show with Edge and Lita. Um, so Tori walks in, uh, Dawn Marie feeds her strawberries, she strips her off, um, just so happens that Tori's wearing, uh, uh, pull undo underwear with, with ties on it, so, I mean, I have a thing for Tori Wilson, I'm not gonna lie, um, and it was sexy, <laughs> I genuinely... Anyway, um, so yeah, all the way through this, she, she stops it at the kiss, uh, and it is a full-on kiss. It's not a half-assed kiss or anything like that. It is full-on. 
she stops it. She says, you people like this? So, well, maybe I'll roll the footage a bit more because Tori Wilson isn't here. At that point, the party pooper known as Al Wilson says, no, you can't do that. That's my daughter. All this time, he's just stood there watching it. Yes. Um, so, Don Marie says that she doesn't care. And she's going to roll the footage anyway. Al Wilson stops it again. And uh, Dawn Marie says, OK, if you don't want me to go any further, we'll go and make our own video back at the hotel room. And Al Wilson accepts, of course, because he's a bloke. Um, but <laughs> there's something quite wrong about this. Really, really, really. Um, yeah. But something wrong and yet yeah, so right. <laughs> yeah, so that's that section, uh, seg segment. Yeah, I've lost my train of thought. Um, and we move on to the next match, which is a newly debuted Batista back in 2002, being accompanied to the ring by, whoa, the nature boy, Ric Flair. And he's going against uh, another monster in Kane. Uh, so Kane hits the pyro before the match and everybody knows that if Kane hits the pyro before the match he's losing anyway a classic big man match doesn't go very long it's hard hitting they, they don't pull any any punches or back strikes clubs or all, all that kind of stuff um, it is full on um, and it's a, it's a decent big man match uh, with Batista picking up the victory uh, with the help of Ric Flair uh, and uh, yeah it, it was okay I'm going to give this one three cheap shots out of five I realised that I've talked more about the uh, hotel room scene than the actual match but when you see that before a match it kind of takes you away from things doesn't it anyway <laughs> Yeah, like I say, good match. Uh, three cheap shots out of five. Um, Batista picks up his victory on the first pay-per-view he has been a part of. And, of course, 12 months later, he would be part of, fully part of the, fully part of Evolution, who would rule the roost um, by December 2003. Next segment at Armageddon 2002 sees the champion Kurt Angle searching for Brock Lesnar, who's in the building and says that he will make his presence felt during the WWE Championship match between Kurt Angle and the Big Show, featuring Paul Heyman, of course. Uh, we then get introduced to John Cena. This was a good year for introductions for new talents. John Cena, Batista, Randy Orton, um, Brock Lesnar, of course. All graduates of uh, Ohio Valley Wrestling, OVW. The precursor to NXT, as it were. And, uh, yeah, it... John Cena comes out, does his rap shtick, and uh, he's there with uh, B Double, uh, B Double Jizzle, whatever his name is, uh, otherwise known as Bob Buchanan. Anyway, uh, he goes a cappella, and it's John Cena. Anyway, we move on to the women's match. It is a triple threat match between Tris Stratus, Jacqueline, and Victoria. It is for the women's championship. And uh, all three of these women just that beat the tar out of each other. You can tell this is the point where Finlay was working with them and doing lots and lots of stuff and saying, yep, yeah, the women can go at the same rate as the guys, and they certainly can. They don't get as much time, and it's really disappointing that the segment with Tori Wilson and Dawn Marie got more time than an actual women's wrestling match, which was actually pretty good for the time that they had, but it couldn't have gone any more than five minutes. And that is pretty much, that is including the entrances as well, uh, which is terrible. But it doesn't take away from this match. Trish does all the work. 
takes out Jacqueline with the chick kick. Victoria pulls Tristrass out of the ring, gets in the ring, gets the one, two, three. Victoria is your winner and still champion. Uh, gonna be gonna be nice this one because it is a decent match. It's not I say it's not very long, can't really review something, but it was neither bad nor terribly good um, because they didn't have much time to uh, do things. So I'm going to go straight down the middle. I'm going to give it two and a half cheap shots out of five. Like I say, really difficult to review this one because of the limited amount of time that they were afforded. Um, just before the WWE Championship match, we do get Kurt Angle and Brock Lesnar finally speaking to each other and... Uh, Kurt Angle says, what's going to happen? You did the unthinkable. You picked up the 500 pound big show and F5'd him. Are you going to be in my corner? Brock still playing his cards close to his chest as we go into the next match. So we move into the WWE Championship match next. And it is the big show, the champion taking the title off of Brock Lesnar with the help of Paul Heyman, who will be at ringside with him for this match. Uh, going against the number one contender, Kurt Angle, who won a, I believe it was a fatal four-way match on SmackDown to get that opportunity. Brock Lesnar has had his suspension lifted uh, by Stephanie McMahon. Thanks to Kurt Angle. And Kurt Angle pleads with Brock Lesnar to be at his side for the match. Because, you know, Paul Heyman is ringside. And as we saw at Survivor Series, that's a good thing for whoever he's with. Now, this match, um, actually really, really good um, too contrasting styles shows how good Big Show is uh, carrying his frame around the ring and uh, shows how good Kurt Angle is carrying Big Show's frame around the ring because it's no it's, it's really no secret that Big Show at this point in time was um, well he's being pushed a little bit but he wasn't healthy uh, 500 pounds, you know, that's going to take its toll. I mean, he looked decent at this point in time. He did. Um, but he's also wearing jeans rather than wrestling gear. So uh, we all know that Vince McMahon is not a lover of people if they look big. Um, to the extent where he will make them put clothes on. You know, you've got Corbin, for example. When he got a little bit bigger... Vince told him to put a shirt on. <laughs> you know, it's, it's terrible, but that's Vince McMahon. So, um, yeah, Kurt Angle really, really well worked this match uh, with Big Show. And we do get a little bit of interference with A-Train or Albert or whatever he's called at this point in time coming down to the ring, giving Kurt Angle that vicious... Backbreaker, which is like an over-the-shoulder backbreaker, dropping down to his knees. Um, after the referee's been taken out, of course. And, uh, yeah, Kurt Angle's in a bit of a state <clears throat> at this point. But he did have the ankle lock on uh, for quite some time before that. And he also did have, he did hit the angle slam as well. Um, that's when A-Train came out. And of course, Paul Heyman being Paul Heyman. But after the backbreaker was hit, Big Show uh, hit the choke slam. Kurt Angle did kick out. And whilst the referee is down again, Brock Lesnar comes out. F5. Kurt Angle crawls into the pin. The referee wakes up as Paul Heyman is getting chased out of the arena in a very comic like fashion that only Paul Heyman could do by Brock Lesnar and we get a new WWE champion at Armageddon. Um, yeah, well deserved. Uh, it's a shame that Big Show didn't hold it for a little bit longer, but it he was sort of like a placeholder 
because it would lead to one of the greatest WrestleMania moments um, of all time at WrestleMania 19 between Kurt Angle and Brock Lesnar, which we'll get into next year, of course, because we are nearing the end of 2022, uh, which means that we're going into the year 2023 and 20 years previous would have been 2003, another great year for WWE, constantly reinventing itself. Anyway, this match, I'm going to give it four cheap shots out of five. Like I say, it is a good match. It's well carried by two veterans of the sport. I say sport, it's sports entertainment with Kurt Angle just being brilliant and big show, showing that he can do stuff. He just can't move around as well as he used to. But you know that being said, he can still he can still get him, which is good. So yeah, that's that's the WWE title match. We then go to WWE New York, uh, or the world as it is now in Times Square, and we find out that the jobber at New uh, in New York at. Uh, the world, I keep keep getting that wrong. I keep wanting to call it WWE New York. Um, at the world is Rob Van Dam. He just had a title match, and you can tell every time they do this segment, month in, month out, that if you've been put there, you've either done something wrong or there's just like a complete deflation of of the wrestlers that are down there. Unless you're Nidia and Jamie Noble, of course, and you have a kissing competition. But, yeah, you can tell. Um, so, yeah, gives Rob Van Dam a chance to be on pay-per-view. Um, I, I don't know if they got paid the same as being actually in the pay-per-view building. Um, but, yeah, gives him gives him chance to show his face. Maybe he's got a bit of an injury from the uh, Elimination Chamber match from Survivor Series. I don't know. But he talks about the two competitors in this match and how much spirit they both have and how cunning Triple H is and of course then you've got Ric Flair at ringside as well completely unpredictable it is a three stages of hell match which is coming up next it's now time for the main event and it is a two out of three falls match otherwise known as the three stages of hell around this time there's only been a very few amount of these matches and it's for a good reason basically the two combatants pick the three matches that they will have and the only occurrence of this that i can think of in modern times before this actually involved triple h and it was against stone cold steve austin steve austin was going for revenge for the the incident with the car and all that kind of stuff because it was it was in 2000 yeah it was 2000 yeah that was it yeah it was it was it was uh uh february 2000 no way out i believe uh no it can't have been no because that that was cactus jack no it was 2001 anyway <clears throat> That was the only other occurrence of this three stages of hell. Uh, in this one, it is a street fight to start us off, followed by a cage match, followed by a ladder match if it's needed. Uh, so basically, if the person gets two straight falls, then the final match is not needed, much like uh, Triple H did in 2001. But he got two straight falls from having uh, having lost the first one, which was a straight wrestling match against Stone Cold Steve Austin. This one is no straight wrestling matches. This one's all about revenge, and it was set up perfectly. Triple H losing the championship to Shawn Michaels, the current world heavyweight champion, in the new concept known as the Elimination Chamber coming back from four years of absence due to a broken back. Very storied. Triple H knows that that's where the weakness is. Triple H also carrying an injury 
into this match. Um, <clears throat> so the first match, Street Fight, second match is a cage match. And if needed, there will be a ladder match. <clears throat> so Michaels and Triple H battled it out inside the ring. Triple H tried to suplex Michaels over the ropes and through a table. But Michaels countered and suplexed Triple H right back into the ring this this first fall actually is really it starts off really well they do the very basics to start with if you are if you are training to be a wrestler and you you watch this match you think actually you know what this is the main event in a major pay-per-view with two of the greatest and you're watching these guys do roll-ups and and all the basics basically um, what's called an international um, before starting to smack each other around the head or Triple H gets a bin and, and all that kind of stuff <coughs> um, yeah so so the street fight is, is nuts uh, Shawn Michaels gets on top quite early quite early on it takes Triple H out of the ring um, does baseball slide takes him out uh, and Triple H goes for a bin underneath the ring, knowing what Shawn Michaels is going to pull next. So he hides the bin underneath his, his sort of prone body. Uh, Shawn Michaels does the springboard uh, over the top rope, and Triple H moves out of the way. Shawn Michaels hits the bin, and he is pretty much down with that one. Um and uh, yeah, Michaels attempts a switch in music. Triple H caught, catches Michaels, uh, Michaels' knee. Triple H focuses on the knee, even though that's not the weak part of Shawn Michaels. It's the weak part of Triple H. But this is where the cerebral assassin really comes in because, um, you know, it's. One of those things, you, if, if you're not carrying the injury that your opponent is, then, or you're carrying an injury that your opponent is not, then it makes sense to bring them back down to your level. Um, and Triple H brings out a, a two by four, it's wrapped in barbed wire, bringing out all of his Cactus Jack memorabilia here, and he lights it on fire because the staging for this show is absolutely brilliant it's got fire and and all sorts of stuff it really looks like an armageddon set um Shawn michaels counters this uh, and nails triple h in the face with the flaming two by four um and hits him straight in the head triple h is busted open early in this one triple h picks up the first fall though as he pins Michaels after hitting a pedigree after getting back to the ring. Uh, so that's it. We get the first fall. There's no breathers in this one. They start lowering the cage. Triple H knows that he's got time to nip outside the ring, start throwing in some weapons, get it nice and, uh, you know, nice and even. Tables, chairs, um, more bins, of course. You've got to go for the bins. And uh, yeah, we're we're into fall two. Um, <clears throat> Triple H uh, catapults Michaels into the cage wall, nice and early here, uh, and uh, starts grinding Michael's head into the cage to bust him open. After a back and forth, Triple H with Triple H and Michaels, uh, this one ends after some real brutality and Ric Flair getting into the ring and getting busted open straight away. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Michaels picks up the victory, setting up the table, putting Triple H on it and uh, hitting a splash off the cage to pick up the second fall. So it does go to a third and final fall, the decider, which is the ladder match. The ring comes down, the Earl Hebner puts the uh, title on the hook and uh, then, you know, it gets raised up in the air and the ladder match is 
yeah, it's phenomenal. Uh, the fact that these two go like they do is insane. Um, and it's just, a t it's, re it's a real sort of testament to these two and how good they actually are, that they are able to carry a match like this. And it's just, it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, so we go into the third and final four. Triple H uh, comes back quickly, followed by Michaels, and he suplexed uh, into uh, onto the ladder. Uh, the match goes back and forth here. They both have attempts to uh, hit each other with. The weapons that are still scattered around the ring got broken tables, uh, used ladders, chairs, bins, you name it, it's there. And we've got then, uh, obviously the ladder gets set up in the middle, Shawn Michaels goes for it, Triple H climbs up the ladder and the conclusion of the match would be Triple H retrieving the World Heavyweight Championship after sending Shawn Michaels out of the ring once he was on top of the ladder and nearly touching the title through the tables that were previously set up on the outside which did actually get moved around in between the transition between the second match and the third match so we knew something big was going to happen with that and so it did Shawn Michaels through the double tables Triple H climbing the ladder and uh, retrieving the championship and we have a new championship um, we have a new champion rather uh, because Shawn Michaels put through four stacked tables on the outside Triple H is once again your heavyweight champion and he's, he has earned this one um, Obviously, the, the, the original run with the title, Triple H, was questionable. Uh, he, did, he did. He did defend the title well. And he, he did get put against some really stiff opposition. But he got handed the title. And I suppose that worked for the privilege of what Triple H was, or who Triple H was and his character at the time. And uh, yeah, he earned, he really did earn the title back. And uh, yeah, Triple H is your new world heavyweight champion. And so we conclude Armageddon 2002, uh, the end of another year. It's been thoroughly entertaining this year from WrestleMania 17. <clears throat> from the Royal Rumble, rather, to WrestleMania 17, to everything. Actually, no, it wasn't 17, it was 18. WrestleMania 18, forget me. WrestleMania 18, absolutely fantastic. Uh, Rock Hogan, get Hulk Hogan coming back, winning the championship. Uh, Brock Lesnar just dominating and, and winning the championship. The Rock winning multiple times. Obviously, The Rock would come back in 2003. So, we've got that to look forward to as well. And, uh, yeah, we go into 2003 on an on a absolute high. This was a time where they did bring out the big matches at the right times. And I can't stress that enough. Like, with modern WWE, you've got pay-per-views named after matches rather than matches being on pay-per-views that deserve big matches um they did sort of break that trend in survivor series in that they bought the war games match but they take they took that away from nxt <coughs> taking that back down sort of um, down not down a peg but back to the developmental they're not they're still having the pay-per-views but they are all at the performance center they're going to try and build that up again i'm sure but um yeah it, it's um 
they did book that trend with the War Games matches, and they were very, very good this year, very good, and deserved to be on the main show. But that does lead, you know, we're talking about modern WWE again, it does lead me to believe that that um, William Regal might be coming back to uh, WWE and uh, taking his role at the head of NXT again. Because that would be really cool. Really cool indeed. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, this is your last dual branded pay per view for 2002. Um, I hope you really enjoyed going through the year 2002 because I really have. I'm going to 2003 on a high <clears throat> and hopefully 2023 on a high as well to uh, get us going and uh, yeah last thing to say is you know hope you have a wonderful christmas thank you very much for supporting all of the channels the gaming channel the movie channel they're doing fantastically i don't get enough on the original channel which is cheap Show entertainment really do not get enough on with that and uh, i want to pick that up but it's difficult working full time and then doing this in the wrestling training as well. I purely do this so I can go back and watch some of the best pay per views that you'll ever watch. And uh, yeah, like I say, thank you very much for indulging me and my fanboyism and just wanting to watch the shows. I would encourage you to go back and watch your favourite shows. It is. Nostalgia at its best. There's some really good stuff on the network, including some of the foreign stuff as well. WXW is, is brilliant, and the old school stuff is fantastic as well. So, yeah, have a brilliant New Year. Uh, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, whatever you celebrate. We're, we're all human. Let's be there for each other. Let's show the love for each other, support each other and not bring each other down because times are bad but wrestling is our escape and let's be let's be human. Let's just have each other's backs and and just get through this together. Can't say how much uh I can't say how much I love you guys <laughs> because without you I wouldn't be still doing this even if it's only one play on the podcast and a couple of plays on youtube i just love it and uh, thank you from the bottom of my heart thank you uh take care of yourselves i'll be here next year i hope you will be too you are the cheap shot nation i am your host luke and i will see you in 2023 <coughs> goodbye Hiya!